Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a series entitled Present Truth in Deuteronomy. Now, Deuteronomy is the one of the oldest books that we know, but Present Truth, well, we found quite a bit of truth in Deuteronomy already. This is lesson number nine, entitled Turn Their Hearts. It's the lesson for November 27 of 2021, and we begin as usual with the word of prayer. Father, we bow before you now asking your guidance as we study some of these very important truths that are in some cases hidden apparently, but uh, we're to, to be revealed in the book of Deuteronomy. Guide us in our discussion together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. A simple fact of life follows us all. We are all sinful. Occasionally we hear some expert bemoan the Christian idea of basic human corruption, but all one has to do is look at the news for a day or so and take a quick survey of human history, and the truthfulness of this Christian doctrine becomes apparent. Or even easier, all one has to do is look in the mirror. Not that far, actually. Whoever has the courage to take a long, deep ins look inside one's own heart, which can be a scary place to go, knows the truthfulness of Romans 3, 9 through 23, which ends with the words, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sabbath afternoon, November 20. You may know already that Romans 9, 3, 9, Romans 3, 9 through 23 are a collection of quotations from Isaiah and the Psalms, which Paul just links together talking about our human sinfulness. And you've already noticed what he concludes there in, in verse 23. But it's interesting to look at the context in which Paul talks about that. It's quite different, apparently. Jim? Romans 3, verses 1 to 4 and 24 to 26. Have the Jews then any advantage over the Gentiles? Or is there any value in, be, excuse me, any value in being circumcised? Much indeed is every, in every way. In the first place, God trusted his message to the Jews. But what if some of them were not faithful? Does that mean that God will not be faithful? Certainly not. God must be true, even though every human being is a liar. As the scripture says, you must be shown to be right when you, are, when you speak and must win your case when you are being tried. Now this is a very interesting verse, excuse me for interrupting, but the idea very specifically here is that God is being tried. How does that work? Who would who could take God to court? Well, it's he, he literally in Greek it says when you take yourself into court. Okay, well, go ahead. Most people don't interpret it that way, do they? No, they certainly don't. Let's finish this, and then we can discuss. Um, but by the free gift of God's grace, all are put right with Him through Jesus, Christ Jesus, who sets them free. God offered him so that by his blood, by his, and then there is a footnote, says Romans 3, excuse me, 3 verses 25 and 26, by his blood or by his sacrificial death, he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in him. God did, did this according to, excuse me, in order to demonstrate that he is righteous. In the past, he was patient and overlooked people's sins, but in the present time, he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. In this way, God shows that he himself is righteous and that he puts right everyone who believes in Jesus. Now, here's a question I want you to answer for me. The first four verses talk about God being judged. And down here at the end, toward the end of the chapter, 25 and 26 especially, it says, God is righteous, he's righteous, he's righteous. That's like almost a conclusion to that first part. And then right in the middle is all that stuff about humans being sinful. 
Now, why is it like that? Does that make sense to you? Never really thought. It's like a sandwich. Yeah. Well, sadly, some of the translations have "May you win your case when you try, or when you judge," yeah. and, and, and uh, several translations. No, it's not. It's not there. It's, that's not the way it is in the Greek. No. Could it be true that salvation comes through a careful study of the life and death of Jesus? I mean, if, as it says, we just looked at here, in the past he was patient, God was patient over people's sins, but at the present time he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. He deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. And Romans 8, verse 3 says, he came to deal with sin. And you get to uh, Hebrews, it says he came to save and not to deal with sin. <laughs> in the next, in the, when he comes again. Yeah, well, the, the, the second time, yeah. yeah. So what is involved in repentance? Do we really understand it, Gary? Uh, repentance includes sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. We shall not renounce sin unless we see its sinfulness. Until we turn away from it in heart, there will be no real change in the life. There are many who fail to understand the true nature of repentance. Multitudes sorrow that they have sinned and even make an outward reformation because they fear that their wrongdoing will bring suffering upon themselves. But this is not repentance in the Bible sense. They lament the suffering rather than the sin. Such was the grief of Esau when he saw that the birthright was lost to him forever. Balaam, terrified by the angel standing at his pathway with drawn sword, acknowledged his guilt lest he should lose his life. But there was no genuine repentance for sin, no conversion of purpose, no abhorrence of evil. Judas Iscariot, after betraying his... It's got him there, 24. That means we move, it's going on to page 24. Oh, okay. Lord exclaimed, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. That's from Matthew 7, 24, Ellen G. White steps to Christ, page 23. All languages have idioms. Idiom is a Greek word, actually, which means of itself or something like that. Idioms are short expressions that say one thing, but everyone knows that they mean something quite different. They may not even, they may even be almost meaningless uh, by themselves, but we know, oh yeah, that means something else. In Hebrew, there's an expression, me yitten, which literally means who will give or who will make it happen. It is sometimes translated just, oh, or more commonly, if only, as in verse 29 below. Myra? Deuteronomy 5, 22 to 29. These are the commandments the Lord gave to all of you when you were gathered at the mountain. When he spoke with a mighty voice from the fire and from the thick clouds, he gave these commandments to no uh, he gave these commandments and no others. Then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. When the whole mountain was on fire and you heard the voice, from the darkness, your leaders and the chiefs of your tribes came to me and said, The Lord our God showed us his greatness and his glory when he, when we heard him speak from the fire. Today, and Can I interrupt there yeah. for a second? Try to imagine this in your mind. I keep trying to picture this in my mind. Here's a mountain, a, a granite mountain basically, we think. Uh, and on top of it, it's a couple of thousand feet up there. It's not a, a huge high mountain. And here is a fire with smoke coming out of it, apparently a black and, and fiery and so forth like this. And here comes this thundering voice following the trumpets. I mean, how would you, how would you feel if something like that happened to you? Well, it would be like standing in Yosemite Valley and having yeah. someone from the top of mountains having fire and dark yeah. clouds and the voice and the voice yeah 
Wow. Um, the Lord our God showed us his, his greatness and his glory when we heard him speak from the fire. Today, we have seen that it is possible for a human being to continue to live even though God has spoken to him. But why should we risk death again? What terrible fire will destroy us? We are sure to die if we hear the Lord, our God, speak again. I, I'm sure it was scary, but... Uh, I, yeah. Well, I mean, just compare that to the other nations around them that were worshiping stones and wood and things like this. I mean, to have... Something speak to you. A thing like that. Yeah. Whoa. But why should we risk death again? That terrible fire will destroy us, and we are sure to die if we hear the Lord our God speak again. As any human being ever lived, has any human being ever lived after hearing the living God speak from a fire? Go back, Moses, and listen to everything that the Lord our God says. Then return and tell us what he said to you. We will listen and obey. Compare yeah. Exodus 20. 18 to 20. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When the Lord heard this, he said to me, I have heard what these people said, and they are right. If only they would always feel like this. If only they would always honor me and obey my commands so that everything would go well with them and their descendants forever. And those two expressions, yeah. Yeah. From a good news Bible. If only, if only. Those two if only expressions are from that Hebrew expression, me yitten. Here, Here no, go ahead. Go ahead. Here is the Lord, the Creator God, the one who made space, time, and matter, the one who spoke our world into existence, the one who breathed into Adam the breath of life, uttering a phrase generally associated with the weaknesses and limitations of humanity. If only, in other words, I can't do anything. I, you know, it's beyond me. But, you know, if only. Which reminds me, I, I like to stop and think about Einstein every once in a while when I read a passage like this. Einstein is the one who gave us that famous quotation: "E equals m c squared," mm -hmm. and out of that we got the idea that you could blow things up with atomic bombs and and you know later on hydrogen bombs and so forth just releasing a tiny little bit of it, of matter just an enormous amount of energy well who put that energy in there god yeah imagine god somehow taking energy and squeezing it down until it becomes matter just yeah. unbelievable what an example of the reality of free will. Here we see that there are limits to what God can do in the midst of the great controversy. This use of meitin reveals that even God can't trample on free will, or he won't. For the moment he did, it would no longer be free. Our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sunday, November 21. We need to remember that the children... Go ahead. We need to remember that the children of Israel promised God three times that they would do whatever he asked them to do. Gordon? Well, Go a lot of people have a problem with the, the idea of the free will or yeah. freedom to choose because if, if uh, that means God couldn't have foreknowledge mm -hmm. because they, uh, you know, here they are, finite beings in time and space are going to try to dictate what the uh, infinite capacity God. is. Yeah. Gordon. A reading from Good News Bible, Exodus 19, 8 first. Then all the people answered together, we will do everything that the Lord has said. And Moses reported this to the Lord. Now I'm going to interrupt there again a second. When was that spoken? Just before, the, just before Sinai, just before the Ten Commandments. They haven't heard anything yet. They were at Sinai. They were at Sinai, and, and Moses says, get ready and prepare yourself. This is all the things you have to do to get ready. God's going to speak to you, and they say, oh, whatever God says, we'll just do it. Sure. Mm -hmm. We've seen him take us through the Red Sea. We've seen the plagues in Egypt. We'll follow him. Yep. He's powerful. Yep. And then Exodus 24, 3 and 7 is similar. It was after, this is now after it. Yeah. Moses went and told the people all the Lord's commands and all the ordinances, and all the people answered, 
we will do everything that the Lord has said. Then he took the book of the covenant in which the Lord's commands were written and read it aloud to the people. They said, we will obey the Lord and do everything that he has commanded. If only, right? Yeah. <laughs> if only. <laughs> and if you follow that up with, with uh, when Moses was gone and, and Joshua was in charge, uh, yeah. chapter one, basically they say the same thing. Mm -hmm. Just but as what, we followed, Moses will follow you, Joshua. Yeah. <laughs> but at the end of that, they says, and if anybody steps out of line, yeah. kill him. Yeah. That's, I mean, it just, that's their mindset. They, they, oh, yeah. yeah, and that. they've right. lived how long in Egypt, and they're now coming out and have no... Well, it was 40 years after they got out of Egypt from, uh, yeah, from but Joshua. They, they, they haven't lived except in their own community. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's part of me that feels very sorry for them because they had this, the only education they had was kill them if they got stepped That's, out of line. Yeah. I mean, yeah. is you, yeah. it, would that be intimidation? Does God use uh, that? That's the question, you see. Is it really true that we just th that just as we are free to sin and turn against God, we're also free to choose to follow Him? What forces on both sides are pressuring us to either follow God or follow Satan? Well, that's a, something we know about every day, right? Does God use pressure? Well, I mean, including... Satan certainly does. Oh, there. I'm, I'm not arguing that one. But, but, but we talk about in the book of Revelation, the beast, but I'm, which, but, gets, yeah. which gets his power from the, from the dragon. Mm -hmm. What nation has a, a dragon as their primary symbol? China. China. Yeah. Yeah. How do they operate? Through yeah. force, fear, intimidation, coercion, duress, etc. But Be God careful. uses pressure. I just said pressure. I didn't say force. I said pressure. So what is what kind of pressure does God use? The truth. That's all. Uh, Love. It's and that is not pressure. It's this. In fact, I was thinking the other day. Remember, in, uh, Samuel, he goes up, and I think it's Samuel 8, he says, uh, you know, the people want a, want a king. And, and, and God says to him, hey, you know, they're, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. Man, talk about, because uh, uh, what did Samuel's kids, uh, were, were, sons were doing, the, the terrible things. And he says, really, they're just rejecting you. My question is, what type of a government was before that time? We well, had the time of the, they were called the judges. But what, they say they're going to have a monarchy. Prior to the monarchy, what did they have? What they had were a group of, uh, uh, every single tribe is represented. There was a, uh, a person who rose up, served as a, quote, judge. Um, and usually they, he would get his start or her start, because some of them were ladies, by leading forth, forth the military and conquering someone who was giving them a lot of trouble and forced back the enemies and then, oh, wonderful, now we're, we're relatively free and so now we can do our thing and the judge keeps track of well. And then things deteriorate and they're back to worshiping idols or whatever and then another enemy comes in and back and forth, judges two and three, it just goes back and forth and back and forth. So. Circular but history. Many people would say, well, they, they had a theocracy. Well, that's it what really was, was not no. a theocracy because... It was supposed to be a theocracy. Well, it was supposed, God was supposed to, as a teacher, is trying to educate his kids. Yeah. But a, a crossy is control. Mm -hmm. a the, God control. God doesn't... It, God has never been controlled the mm -hmm. people's... Uh, well, if he, if he chose to control, we would be nothing but robots because he, he has yeah. ultimate power. Yeah. And, and so when the serpent says, no, you're not going to die, well, past history, they've never seen any, any intelligent creatures die. And you're going to be like the gods, knowing good and evil. That's an also a true statement. But how many people say that the, that the serpent was lying? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some critical scholars do not believe that Moses could have written Deuteronomy because they believe that not even God can predict the future. And Deuteronomy so clearly spells out the future conditions that would happen to the Israelites. But all through the Bible, God demonstrated his capacity to predict the future. Consider especially the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. I mean, look at that, 2,300 years. 
Critical scholars say that if that is true, that he can predict the future, then we have no free choice. But God's foreknowledge, even of our free choices, has no bearing whatsoever on the freedom of our choices. God has ways of doing that we as human beings cannot understand how God can know our future choices without there being some predetermined reason for those choices that would then make those choices no longer free. But he is God, and there are many things which God knows and understands that we have no knowledge of and cannot understand. And they don't want to admit that, of course. That's the problem. They being? Critical scholars. Who are and the ones that teach the theologians. And evolutionists and other people like that. Who limit God. Yes. No. Since God can't predict the future, you know, this wasn't written by Moses. It was written right. yes, way yes. later. A thousand years later. Yeah. And the, the assumption is that God must be learning on the job. Yeah. Mm. yeah. He, he hasn't quite got things figured in. It, 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 but we know. Yeah. But, and, but it's a, where it's a minority of those that, uh, yeah. you, you don't get, find that in any other persuasion out there in the other church. When you got 45,000 Christian denominations now, how many of them yeah. have the truth? And so Maybe in Deuteronomy... Huh? Maybe zero. It might be, yeah. And so in Deuteronomy, we see that God predicted even the fact that the children of Israel would go into captivity. And we see that in Deuteronomy 4, 25 to 28. Even when you have been in the land a long time and have children and grandchildren, do not sin by making for yourselves an idol in any form at all. This is evil in the Lord's sight and it will make him angry. Now, we need to stop on that one again. We're going to talk about that several places in this lesson. God's wrath or his anger is simply his turning away in loving disappointment from those who don't want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. Not so, only do they not want him, but they have repeatedly rejected God yeah. and said, I don't want you, I don't want you, I don't want you. I want it my way. Yeah. yeah. Like some kids. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that if you disobey me, you will soon disappear from the land. You will not live very long in the land across the Jordan that you're about to occupy. You will be completely destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the nations where only a few of you will survive. There will be... There you will serve gods made by human hands, gods of wood and stone, gods that cannot see or hear, eat or smell. And do we have any evidence that any of the Jewish people ever, actual names of people who, or, or not necessarily actual names, but stories about people or groups that actually worshipped pagan idols? Well, we don't have to go very far. Even just uh, some of the kings and yep. so on, they were worshiping Solomon. foreign gods in the temple, in yep. Solomon's temple. Solomon sacrificed his own children to pagan gods. Moloch. Yeah. Kidron Valley. Yeah. Well, why were the children of Israel so tempted to worship pagan idols? Think of all the things that the pagans were worshiping in those days. Jim? Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 20. When the Lord spoke to you from the fire on Mount Sinai, you did not see him, see any form. For your good, then... For your own good, skip, then. For your own good, then make certain that you do not sin by making for yourselves an idol in any form at, at all, whether you see a woman whether a man or a woman, animal, bird, reptile, or fish, do not be tempted to worship and serve what you see in the sky, the sun, the moon, the, and the stars. The Lord your God has given these to all other people for them to worship. That's a good, worth it, some discussion there. Yeah, we'll get to that. But you are the, but you are the people he rescued from Egypt, that blazing furnace. He brought you out to make you his own people as you are today. Good News Bible. These words seem very strange to some of us with our ethical thinking today. Was it really true that God wanted some people in the world to worship the sun, the moon, and the stars? 
even animals, birds, reptiles, or fish. Can you think, do you remember the name of the fish god? Dagon. Dagon, that's right. The, the um, Philistines worshiped the fish god. Because they were sea people. Yeah. What this is suggesting is that those people in those other lands in the days of Moses had chosen to worship those things as their gods. And things that the gods do in ancient times, they thought, okay, there's only one power up there and some kind of well, maybe a collect collection of powers, but they all work together. So they must have, you know, divided up the territory. Well, you go to Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9, addresses that right after with, with uh, Noah, and they mm -hmm. departed the nations according to the sons of God. Mm -hmm. if you, if we, uh, you have that's that not Deuteronomy. No, uh, yeah, Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9. And not Noah. No, this was after Noah. This is a long at, time after at, Noah. At the time of Noah, but Deuteronomy thirty-two eight and nine. When God separated the nations, He did it according to the sons of God. Uh, now that and, and, that was, and the Jacob was His special portion. Okay. And uh, well, what this is suggesting is that those people in those other lands in the days of Moses had chosen to worship those things as their gods. It is not suggesting that Yahweh, the Hebrew God, was the one who had caused it to happen. It was commonly believed in the days of Moses that the world was divided up not only by countries, nationalities, languages, etc., but also by gods. Each territory was thought to be ruled by a different god. That's where you, Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 comes okay. in. Unfortunately, the Masoretic text, according to the sons of Israel, and which is not the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the ESV, the RSV, the New RSV, and the Septuagint says sons of God. Mm -hmm. What is amazing in all of this is that God repeatedly said that if the children of Israel would finally come back to him, even after going into exile, he would receive them and bless them once again. Carrie? A reading from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 29 through 31. There you will look for the Lord your God, and if you search for him with all your heart, you will find him. When you are in trouble and all those things happen to you, then you will finally turn to the Lord and obey him. He is a merciful God. He will not abandon you or destroy you, and he will not forget the covenant that he himself made with your ancestors. And that's from the Good News Bible. Yep. That was the covenant that they said, all that the Lord says we will do. Well, at this point in our study, we might be tempted to think that we do not worship any pagan gods in our day. But what are the worst sins of which we need to repent? God does not regard all sins as of equal magnitude. There are degrees of guilt in his estimation, as well as that of man. But however trifling this or that wrong act may seem to the, in the eyes of man, no sin is small in the sight of God. Man's judgment is, is partial, imperfect, but God estimates all things as they really are. The drunkard is despised and is told that his sin will exclude him from heaven, while pride, selfishness, and covetousness too often go unrebuked. But these are sins that are especially offensive to God, for they are contrary to the benevolence of his character, to that unselfish love which is the very atmosphere of the unfallen universe. I must have misheard that because it sounded like my sins of pride, selfishness, and covetousness are worse than, dr than the drunkard. And that's, well, that's exactly, that's exactly what, it what it says. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> he who falls into some of the grosser sins may feel a sense of his shame and poverty and his need of the grace of Christ, but pride feels no need. And so it closes the heart against Christ and the infinite blessings he came to give. Ellen G. White, Steps to Christ, page 30. That's incredible. Yeah. These ideas in Deuteronomy are also reflected in the New Testament. 
Galatians 6, 7, and 8 from Good News Bible. Do not deceive yourselves. No one makes a fool of God. People will reap exactly what they sow. If they sow in the field of natural desires, from it they will gather the harvest of death. If they sow in the field of the Spirit, from the Spirit they will gather the harvest of eternal life. So why is sinning so natural, almost like breathing? And what is God's response even if we depart very far from Him? And here's what He said to the children of Israel on that subject, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 to 10. I have now given you a choice between a blessing and a curse. When all these things have happened to you and you are living among the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you, you will remember the choice I gave you. If you and your descendants will turn back to the Lord and with all your heart obey his commands that I am giving you today, then the Lord your God will have mercy on you. He will bring you back from the nations where he has scattered you, and he will make you prosperous again. I mean, this is, this is Moses predicting things that are going to happen a thousand years later. Coming back from the Babylonian captivity. Yeah, exactly. Even, How could he possibly do that? Yeah, right. How could God do that? Right. Even if you are scattered to the farthest corners of the earth, the Lord your God will gather you together and bring you back so that you may again take possession of the land where your ancestors once lived. And you can imagine that the, the Jewish people re going back to uh, Palestine after Second World War, this, was, this must have been their key text. And he will make you more prosperous and more numerous than your ancestors ever were. The Lord your God will give you and your descendants obedient hearts so that you will love him with all your heart and you will continue to live in that land. He will turn all these curses against your enemies who hated you and oppressed you. And you will again obey him and keep all his commands that I'm giving you today. The Lord will make you prosperous in all that you do. You will have many children and a lot of livestock and your fields will produce abundant crops. Now, Every time I read this, I stop and ask, okay, what's happening here? Is God saying, oh, he's obeying giving more animals. He's obeying giving him better crops. Is that, is that the way this happens or what's going on? Or is it God saying, what? That's what it sounds like. Sounds like. And that's certainly what the Jews and maybe us think, or we think, you know, this guy is driving a Mercedes, a Rolls Royce, whatever. He must be blessed by God. This preacher is driving a seven wonderful cars, you know, a different car every day. He <laughs> must be God's right yeah, hand. Yeah, exactly. And his and health but is no, good. it's is, not. Yeah. His health, health is good. Health, wealth. Yeah. yeah. Influence. Yeah. Well, I think in the light of the great controversy. God is able to say to Satan, if, if, if we rebel against him, God has to stand back and let Satan do his thing. If we obey him, God says, Satan, stand back. Now I can do my thing for these people. And I, I think it's possible. Now, you won't read that in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is not like uh, uh, Revelation. There's virtually no talk about the devil in the book of Deuteronomy. Is there any talk of the devil in, in Deuteronomy? No. But you will have to obey him and keep all his laws that are written in this book of his teachings. You will have to turn to him with all your heart. We may mess up terribly, and the consequences will follow. But if we return to God, he will always take us back. There is no sin that God is not willing to forgive. So what is implied when we say that we want to repent or turn back to God? What is the real nature of repentance? Jim? Change direction. The Bible does not teach that the sinner must repent before he can heed the invitation of Christ. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavily, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. It is the virtue that goes forth from Christ that leads to gener, excuse me, genuine repentance. Peter made all matter clear in this statement to the Israelites when he said, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. For to give 
repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins, we can no more repent without the Spirit of Christ to awaken the conscience than we can be pardoned without Christ. Steps Steps to Christ, Christ again. Uh, page 26. But let us be honest. Repentance is not a simple choice. Oh, once saved, always saved. No, it doesn't work like that. It involves a complete change in thinking, a paradigm change. God is willing, and conversion means, what does a convertible mean? A convertible means the top can go down or it can go up, right? It, it, it can change. So conversion means you can change. God is willing to, God is willing to change our hearts if we're willing to allow him to do so. Well, and, that, that whole process, is, is it not education? Yeah. I mean, it, it takes t education generally takes time. And if our hearts are changed, our actions will change. This is what is known as obedience. Gary? All true obedience comes from the heart. It was hard work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims. Now let me interrupt, interrupt for a second, Gary. Who's going to do what? He will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims. In other words, if we give him an opportunity to operate in our minds, to think about him, to Bible study and prayer, and, and allow him into our lives, what happens? Go on, soul blend. So blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. The will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight delight rather in doing his service when we know god as it is our privilege to know him our life will be a life of continual obedience through an appreciation of the character of christ through communion with god sin will become hateful to us sin. sister white desire of ages yeah. age six six six, six yes yeah, incredible six, six, passage you at the top of that paragraph that, that, that we just read? All true obedience comes from the heart. True obedience comes from the heart. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Yes. Who can know it? Okay, so that's why it says, who can make the change? Only God can make the change. He has to come into our lives and make the change. We can't do it ourselves. That's, that's, what, that's the message here. So sin's supposed to become hateful to us? What if I like to sin? Well, that's the problem. We all like to sin. So that sounds like aversion therapy. <laughs> right. in the, in you the, finally get so sick and tired of living in a, a you know, that you, uh, it, some people are not, don't warm to that idea, but it is not too far off. In the case of the children of Israel, God was willing to take back even those who had lived their entire lives in captivity in Babylon or Assyria. Can you think of a prophet who spent almost his entire life in Babylonian captivity? Someone Daniel. besides Daniel? Well, Daniel is one. Can you think of any others? Ezekiel. Ezekiel spent most of his time. Zechariah, Haggai, a whole bunch of them. When Peter spoke to the people after the resurrection of Christ on the great day of Pentecost, he made this comment. Acts 5, 31. God raised him to his right-hand side as leader and savior to give the people of Israel the opportunity to repent and to have their sins forgiven. Good News Bible. Ellen White commented upon the similar situation, commenting upon a similar situation, said... From Patriarchs and Prophets, page 557. The people mourned because their sins had brought suffering upon themselves, but not because they had disobeyed God, dishonored God by transgression of his holy law. True repentance is more than sorrow for sin. It is a resolute turning away from evil, a change, mm -hmm. in other words. Exactly. What difference is there between being sorry for the consequences of our sins and being sorry for the sin itself? Why is this distinction so important? 
Both John the Baptist and Jesus, when they began their ministries, called for people to repent and turn away from their sins. So it's not if I get away with it, you know, that kind of reinforces it, that you know, it's okay, but mm. that doesn't mean it's not a sin, no? Yeah, it doesn't. Okay. Matthew 3, 1 to 8. At that, at that time, John the Baptist came to the desert of Judea and started preaching, turn away from your sins. He said, because the kingdom of heaven is near. John was the man the prophet Isaiah was talking about when he said, someone is shouting in the desert, prepare a road for the Lord, make a straight path for him to travel. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. He rode a leather, he wore a leather belt round his waist. You know, and I, you know, I keep thinking of crazy things when I read these passages. How do you suppose someone like John, living out in the desert, could collect camel's hair to make clothes out of? Anyway, his food was locusts Someone and... gave it to him? Maybe? Possible? He traded some of his locusts and honey. Yeah. Okay. Locusts, there's two options here. Locusts are one of the acceptable things that the Bible says you can eat. If you're talking about grasshoppers here, they're enormous. The, the locusts that occur in that part of the world are huge. They, he could they devastate a whole yeah. lot of... He, he could have been eating them. There's also a kind of bean that's called a locust. So he could have been eating that. We don't know where he would have gotten it from. He used to have three... Well, isn't it those two, what they call Jake, St. John's uh, breadfruit, uh, carob trees? Some people, I don't know, maybe. I used to have three of them out in front of my house when I was a kid. People came to him from Jerusalem, from the whole province of Judea, and from all the country near the River Jordan. They confessed their sins, and he baptized them in the Jordan. When John saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to him to be baptized, he said to them, You snakes! That's a nice, comfortable thing to say to people. Who told you that you could escape from the punishment God is about to send? Do those things that will show that you have turned from your sins. In other words, what needs to happen? Turn from your sins. Read Mark 1.15. What did Jesus say? Why did he relate repentance with the gospel? Jim, that's yours. Mark 1.15. The right time has come, he said, and the kingdom of God is near. Turn away from your sins and believe the good news. Good News Bible. So what is the sequence that affects people who turn back to God? What is the relationship among repentance, conversion, justification, and sanctification? You've probably heard someone say that all you need to do is be justified. Well, does repentance and conversion have to come before justification or justification the same as repentance? Some people want to make justification the same as repentance. Notice these interesting words from Ellen White. Carrie, I think well, that's yours. I was ruminating over what you just said above. At every advanced step in Christian experience, our repentance will deepen. It is to those whom the Lord has forgiven, to those whom he acknowledges as his people, that he says, then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight, from Ezekiel 36, 31. Again he says, I will establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, that thou mayest remember and be confounded, and never open thy mouth any more because of thy shame when I am pacified toward thee for all that thou hast done, saith the Lord God. That's wow. Ezekiel 16, verse 16, 62 that's, rather, 63. That's that incredible chapter where he talks about God marrying a couple of basically prostitutes. Wow. And of course, who's he talking about? He's talking about his relationship with Israel and, Israel and, and Judah, right? Okay, go ahead then our lips will not be opened in self-glorification. <clears throat> we shall know that our sufficiency is in Christ alone. We shall make the apostles' confession our own. 
I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. That's from Romans 7, 18. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. That's Galatians 6, 14. And from Ellen White's Christ Object Lessons, page 160, paragraph 3. Okay. <coughs> Myra? Um, the goodness? Yeah. Is that mm -hmm. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, Romans 2, 4. The golden chain, the mercy and compassion of divine love is passed around every imperiled soul. God declares, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn thee, Jeremiah 31, 3. And uh, Ellen G. White, Christ Object Lessons, page 202. Let us not make the mistake of thinking that the repenting alone is some kind of good deed that will bring us merit with God. Does the realization of our sinfulness help us to be humble? Should it? it should. Shouldn't it? What is the path for returning to God when we have wandered away from Him? We must honestly want to seek Him. When we honestly return to Him, God's forgiveness is automatic. I mean, think about Jesus lying out there on the cross and they're, they're nailing him to the, to, the, to the cross and he's saying, Father, forgive them. Amazing. But the return must include a true change of heart. And in the case of the children of Israel, this would have resulted in the fulfillment of the wonderful promises, I'm sorry, prophecies that were given to them. So what is your understanding of God's character? When you think about God, do you believe that He really, really, honestly wants you to come back? Luke 15, 7, it, Jesus said, In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 respectable people who did not need to repent. And you, mean I, you mean He doesn't want me if I'm respectable? Well, let's think about that for a moment. Who were the respectable people in, in Jesus' day? Pharisees and Sadducees. And they didn't think they needed to repent. Remember the, the Pharisee, the young man who came to Jesus says, all these things I've done from my youth up. I'm perfect. Mm -hmm. There is no merit in our repentance. Our previous sinful ways would naturally only lead to death. But God's graciousness loving kindness and forgiveness. Look over those previous sins and welcome us back and rejoi with rejoicing if we are willing to change. We might be frightened to think about the holiness of God. It might scare us even to approach Him. What did the children of Israel say about God appearing to them on the Mount Sinai? Reading again Deuteronomy 5, 24 and 25, and said, The Lord our God showed us his greatness and his glory when we heard him speak from the fire. I don't, did they actually see a, a ball of fire up there with smoke coming up from it? I, I, don't know, I wish we had a picture of it. But then the, he, God specifically says, don't, I won't, don't want you to make any images of it because you know, I'm trying to avoid. I mean, fire, you know, fire's awfully hard to make an image of. Yes. And what's the problem of making images as of something? It gives, doesn't it give you a false concept of what reality well, is? Well, you think you, have, you can control it. You and think, you could think that's all there is. Mm -hmm. You don't realize that there's a lot more. Mm -hmm. Well, they go on and went on to say, Today we have seen that it is possible for a human being to continue to live even though God has spoken to him. But why should we risk death again? That terrible fire will destroy us. We are sure to die if we hear the Lord our God speak again from the Good News Bible. But surely we have learned in our lesson this week that God will accept back virtually anyone who is willing to really come back. Think about this story. Here's a, here's a challenge. Jim? Simon Wiesenthal, the Nazi hunter tells the story of his encounter with a former Nazi officer who was dying in a hospital. 
the Nazi asked Wiesenthal to forgive him for the horrific crimes he had committed against Jewish civilians, without which, he claimed, he would not die in peace. Wiesenthal, who kept silent throughout the encounter, walked away without responding to the Nazi's request. Wiesenthal concludes the story with a question. What would you have done, Simon Wiesenthal? Okay, and the book The Sunflower, so forth, is quoted in the Adventist Bible Study Guide, Teacher's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 121. Wow. You know, I have been twice to Auschwitz in Poland. It's an absolutely incredible place. And the response you get from the people who work there, supposedly the, the German soldiers, we were just doing what we were told. We were just doing what we were told. We were following orders. Following orders. But what, mm. what happens now with in some of the stuff we've been hearing about recently? Well, that's what's happening in China. And how would you have responded in that situation? Interestingly, the Hebrew root, shuv, combines in itself both requirements to turn from evil and to turn back to God, who will be found again on the old paths. Remember, that's an expression from the Old, from the New, old Testament, saying, come back to the old paths. This parallel movement implies a profound insight. The best way to resist evil is to do good. The best way to resist evil is what? To do good. To good. Just as the children of Israel you've found... Said, you've said many times, you can't uh, just get can't, rid of evil. You have stamp to crowd out it out. Yep, you have to crowd it out. Just as the children of Israel found it impossible to transform themselves, God recognized that it is true also of us. Carrie, you want to take the next one there? Yes, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. So then, from now on, be obedient to the Lord and stop being stubborn. Wow. The Good News Bible. I mean, what would, how would you, what would you say if, if God said, if you heard God saying to you, stop being stubborn? Maybe I mean, you should pay attention. Wow. Wake you up. Listen up. Uh, Jeremiah. He wasn't talking to me, was he? Yeah. <laughs> you weren't stubborn. Thank you, dear. <laughs> Jeremiah 4, 22, the Lord says, My people are stupid. They don't know me. They are like foolish children. They have no understanding. They are experts in doing what is evil, but failures at doing what is good. Good news, Bible. In Jeremiah 13, 23, Can a Nubian change the color of his skin, or a leopard remove its spots? Let me interrupt for a second. Where is Nubia? It's, uh, well, Africa is a big place. Yeah. It's um, below, e it's south of Egypt. South of Egypt in an area now which would be considered uh, a little bit of, I think, is in Ethiopia, but most of it was in Sudan. Yeah. And I can tell you those people are just black as black can be. I mean, if you see somebody that's really black, you better think Nubia. Hmm. Go ahead. So again, from Jeremiah 13, 23, can a Nubian change the color of his skin or a leopard remove its spots? If they could, then you that do nothing but evil could learn to do what is right. I should say, just to add to my comments, I'm wondering, well, some people say the Nubians are so black that they look blue. You've seen, I mean, anyway, maybe you haven't, but uh, it's, their skin is really black. And then Hosea 5, verse 4, The evil that the people have done prevents them from returning to their God. Idolatry has a powerful hold on them, and they do not acknowledge the Lord. Hosea, remember, was addressed to the children of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, just maybe five years, ten years, before they were completely conquered and just scattered by the Assyrians. And so it's a very sad story. Why is it impossible for sinners to transform themselves? Do we recognize the fact that only God can perform such a procedure? Are we willing to allow him to do that? When we think very carefully about the life and death of Jesus Christ, and if we agree, God will transform us and give us a desire to be more like him. To know God is to love him. 
So how do we get transformed? Learn about God. If we really get to know Him, it will change us. Think of your personal experiences. Have you sinned against someone and asked for their forgiveness? Did you need to do it more than once? I mean, how many times do we ask God to forgive us? Now we think if we have, if we have to ask another person more than once, sorry, and we expect them to say, okay. And how many times do we say that to God? Here's an excuse, an uh, exercise, I'm sorry, that we are asked to try in our lesson. Think of someone that you trust. It may be a spouse, son, daughter, or someone else close to you. Then explain to that person that you're going to pick a particular day. Uh, it could be anything from Sabbath to Christmas. You're picking a birthday. You're going to record your failures, regrets, and your victories for one week prior to that day. You're going to record them. What should we learn from such an experiment? How often do we repeat the same mistakes again and again and again? Review the experience of David with Bathsheba. Again, read Psalm 51. And remember, in Psalm 51, they, David just pours out his heart, you know, and he's just saying, you know, I don't know what I was, what I was thinking, God, please, and there's two things that, let me just look at Psalm 51 for a second. There's two things that are really important there. You know, he just, in the first part, he just says, please cleanse me and so forth like this. But notice when it gets to verse 10, he says, create a pure heart in me, O God, and put a new and loyal spirit in me. Do not banish me from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. And you notice that in most translations, it has Holy Spirit with small letters. It's not a person, it's just his, what, is the well, message that he has for people. That's, that's the question. Is this really, is it the God that we know, or is this just an influence or something? Um, anyway. Spirit of truth. Are we prepared to do what David did to honestly want to change and be willing to let God do that for us? The challenge is for us. Think about it yourself. Are you willing to let God come into your life to make the changes necessary for you to represent Him before those that we associate with? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, please make us willing. Help us to realize our need to open our hearts and our minds to let you influence us. It's so easy for us to have ideas that we know all the right answers, that we know how to do this, we know how to do that, we don't need guidance. But Lord, we know how desperately we need your guidance. Help us not to be like the children of Israel who did wandered away from you despite promising so many times that uh, they would just obey no matter what. Lord, we are coming so close now, not to just the promised land, but to the second coming. Help us to be faithful and true as you want us to be, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.